Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name's Gail. I'm an alcoholic. That's the nicest introduction I've ever had. It's not the most honest, but it is the nicest. If you can't hear me, just yell. That rarely happens. Drunk or sober. I have never been soft-spoken. And the more scared I get, the louder I get. (laughs) You know, the problem with speaking at at a convention like this is that as opposed to just talking at a meeting at home, I want to be good. You know, I want to be good because I've known Roy for a long time and because you people were kind enough to pick up my expenses and because I've got friends here. And it's impossible, I think, to give an honest talk in Alcoholics Anonymous thinking about I want to be good. Yeah. And if you're if you're relatively new around Alcoholics Anonymous, and by that I mean less than five years, so that's going to be a shock to some of you that are three years sober and know it all. But that's my opinion. Anyway, if you're if you're less than five years sober, then you got to know being a speaker is not the measure of the sober alcoholic. And don't for one minute think so. And that's more important for the people who do a lot of talking to know. Because some of the finest speakers I've heard in Alcoholics Anonymous have died drunk. And some of the finest members of Alcoholics Anonymous that I've ever known never spoke from podium. I had a sponsor named Polly who was 19 years sober. And I doubt that there's been anybody over the years that has helped more people in Los Angeles. And Polly never talked from a podium because she wasn't a speaker. You know, she was a doer. And we can fall into that trap, and I've done it, and that's why I talk about it, of getting into talking and not doing. And that's one of the things that brought me here in the first place because, you know, I always had good intentions. I had good intentions before I started drinking, and I had good intentions while I was drinking. And my intentions are not as good today as they've ever been in the past. So, because now I know my limitations, and I know what I'm responsible for and what I'm not. You know, but I was one of those people that just, I always meant well. And if I wasn't passed out or slurring my words too much, I usually sounded good. I had a good education, a lot of information. And before I got so senile, you know, I was relatively bright. And I I really meant to meet you at 6 o'clock. You know, I meant to do that. And I meant all the things I used to talk about, the, the caring. I did a lot of drinking over starving children in India. You know? <laughs> and I was involved in a lot of causes and did a lot of what would start out as marching and end up with me being carried. You know? <laughs> And I've been carried through some fairly important mo- movements, you know. <laughs> and if you were my friend and you had a problem, I always wanted to help. I mean, I really did. And I would stagger over to help you. And, you know, then you had two problems. You had, <laughs> you had your problem, and then you had me helping. Well, so that... Being that kind of an alcoholic, one of the most important things that I had to learn here, and by the way, the things I've learned, I've learned over 18 years. I didn't learn them the first 30 days or the first two or three years. It's for someone like me, I know full well that what I say doesn't mean a damn thing as far as my sobriety is concerned. I would like to think that maybe I'll say something and give someone a little hope so you don't all leave AA tomorrow. But what I say doesn't mean anything. What will keep me sober, and I believe what will keep you sober, is what we do. And that for me, and the the kind of phony that I was, is what matters. 
I'm going to try and talk about sobriety, but um, if you're new, <laughs> in case I forget to tell you, I used to drink an awful lot. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Kentucky uh, from a nice family, Irish Catholic family, which is not to be confused with the Roman Catholic. It's an entirely different world out there. <laughs> yeah. And I was just one of those kids that I really loved my family a lot, but they didn't have what I wanted, you know. And Kentucky's a pretty state, but it didn't have what I wanted. I wanted to, to get out. Uh, I grew up on Warner Brother movies, and I wanted what Alan Ladd had and Ann Sheridan and that kind of, well, I really, I wanted what Ann Sheridan had, and I wanted to be Alan Ladd. <laughs> <laughs> but, That's literally true. When I was drinking in Chicago, I used to wander around. I had a trench coat, and I used to carry a gun. And I'd knock on doors with the gun, you know. And if you ever saw this gun for hire, you'll know what I mean. But, and there's, uh, the Catholic Church didn't do anything to me, and the nuns didn't do anything to me. You know, I have a friend, we talked about the The problem with being raised in, in Catholic boarding schools, if you're a girl, is that we were taught to be women by women who'd given that up a long time ago. <laughs> but the church didn't do anything to me. I mean, I've heard a lot of people that come in here and and have a what they believe an honest quarrel with the church, and I've seen people, you know, go to their graves still with a lot of guilt. It just never took with me, you know, because they were always... I'm not talking about my going to heaven, and I wanted to go to New York. I wasn't interested. <laughs> or, you know, gee, you're great. You really <laughs> You know, our streets paved with gold. I wanted gold chains when I was 10. I knew better than that. But I don't think I was any stranger than, than a lot of the other kids, and I don't think my childhood had anything to do with my becoming a drunk. I am of the opinion that homosexuality had absolutely nothing to do with my becoming a drunk. I think had I stayed in Louisville, married the boy next door, had three children, I would have just been a housewife drunk. But I would have become an alcoholic anyway. And because uh, being Irish, there were just a lot of alcoholics in the family, I wasn't raised around it. The only time I saw the alcoholics in the family was at funerals. And I loved funerals, you know, because they'd, they'd get drunk, and my aunts would come in from exciting places like Detroit, <laughs> Chicago. <laughs> and if, if you're from Louisville, Detroit's a big deal. <laughs> and they dragged mink coats, and they were driving Cadillacs, and, and they drank, and they got into fights, and they threw people downstairs. And my, you know, drunken grandfather, who I only saw at funerals, would give my brother and I a lot of money. And I kind of equated drinking and those people with, with fun, and it seemed to me we weren't having much fun where I was. No. So by the time I was uh, 21 years old, I, I became an airline stewardess, and I went off into that world. Now, I read a lot. You know, I read Hemingway and Fitzgerald and all of that, and I wanted to go be part of the lost generation. And I never felt like I really belonged in Louisville because, truthfully, I thought I was just brighter than them, and if they were bright, they would have left Louisville. <laughs> and yet, I had this, this mouth going and this head full of sophisticated information and no experience whatsoever. And to tell you what it was like and really what it was like until I got here is when I left for the airlines after going away parties and people saying, aren't you afraid to leave home? And I thought, me afraid? Are you kidding? After all the movies I've seen, what should I be afraid of? <laughs> And the airline I went to work for was on strike. And that should have been a clue that I should have stayed home right there. But <laughs> my mother and her best friend took me down and put me on the train. And I was excited. I mean, I was really excited. In those days, it was a big deal to be a stewardess. And they left. And the train didn't. And I sat there, and within like three minutes, I got so homesick, so lonely, so scared that I got off the train, and I was home before my mother. <laughs> now, that's how I was going out into the world. No. 
And I, I wanted to die of mortification, you know, and I, I didn't want my mother to tell anyone. I don't know what I thought she was going to do with me. Just hide me in the attic for, you know, 60, 70 years, whatever it was. My mother's a nice lady, so uh, she took me out, and they bought me a ticket on Eastern Airlines, and I left home with my mother saying, Honey, if you get too homesick, you call, and Daddy and I'll come get you. And that's how little Miss Big Shot went off into the world. And I kind of spent the next years with that same thing, the, the mouth and, and the outside and wanting to go places and wanting to meet people and this scared little person in there. You know? And until I got the Alcoholics Anonymous, I didn't know there was anyone like me. I really didn't. I heard a woman in Alcoholics Anonymous say that if I would work these steps, that someday my insides and my outsides would match, and I never knew there was anyone else on earth that was just working real hard just to keep up, just trying to keep up with my life, you know. There's In Alice in Wonderland, there's a, a line where he says, here, you have to run as fast as you can to stay where you are. And it seemed like that's the way I spent most of my life in the first few years of my spread, just running as fast as I could to stay where I was, wherever that was. Most of the time I didn't know. And I didn't drink until I was 22. No. And I didn't drink because I was kind of scared of it. And I was going with a guy that I thought was real sophisticated. I wouldn't go with anyone unless they intimidated me. No. And because, because that's why I thought it was exciting. And I was out with him one night, and he was tired of me drinking Cokes, and he said that I embarrassed him. And he ordered me a gimlet. Now, that's got to be one of the most sickening drinks ever, you know. <laughs> And so I had a gimlet just to please him. Then I had another one to please me. (laughs) (laughs) Then I had another one to please his best friend who was with us. Mm -hmm. Then I had a couple more, and then I told my boyfriend at the time how much I hated him and always had. (laughs) And then I went home with his best friend. (laughs) Yeah. And that was it. And I solved two major problems that night. (laughs) And I kind of went just overnight from not knowing what to say at the door to trying to figure out how do I get him out of the bathroom in the morning. You know, just. (laughs) And I love drinking. You know, I spent a long time sober. Uh, And I think we're all trying to figure out why, blah, 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 blah. And I had years of psychiatric help and all of that, why I drank. And I've just come to the conclusion finally. I drank because I just love drinking. I mean, I loved everything about it. I liked bars and nightclubs and roadhouses, and I liked uh, I liked being drunk in the beginning, and I had a lot of fun, and drinking enabled me to go a lot of places that I wanted to go and do a lot of things that I wanted to do that they did in books and movies, and little Catholic girls from Louisville, Kentucky can't do on the natural. And I don't know what day it got away from me. You know, I didn't notice. I didn't say, Jesus, Gail, now today you've become an alcoholic. You're drinking alone in a bar. Uh, I don't know when I started drinking in the morning. It was just perfectly natural to me. I don't even know when the fun stopped. Uh, Because I think I kept drinking a few years after the fun stopped. And that's the sad thing about alcohol, is that all I wanted to do really was have a good time. I never wanted to hurt anyone. I never woke up in the morning and said, I'm going to have a few drinks and break my mother's heart. I never decided to have a couple martinis and ruin my life. I never knowingly sat down and made a decision to hurt myself or anyone else. And yet, because of my drinking, I hurt a lot of people and damn near killed myself. And it just kind of went downhill. And and meanwhile, there were lots of cities and lots of countries and lots of people. And I think, you know, if only I had him, I'd be fine. If only I had her, I'd be fine. If only I had him and her, I'd be terrific. No. If I could get to that city, if I could get to that country, if I could, if I could, if only, if only, if only. And all these things were just designed that I'll be happy. Uh, If this, I'll be happy. If that, I'll be happy. And one of the things that I've learned in Alcoholics Anonymous is I have never known and still do not know today what will make me happy. I don't know. Because when I came in here, had God herself handed me a book and and said, this is 
what it's going to be like the next 18 years. I'd have leafed through it, you know, and, and I would have left because I would have figured, hey, you know, look, now these things you say are going to make me happy. Uh, you've got to be kidding. You know, you just got to be kidding. Those things not only wouldn't make me happy, uh, they're boring. <laughs> well, and I don't see what's so much fun about, what, you know, what the hell, I'm going to fly to Houston and do what? <laughs> you know, I, I may go to Houston, but... I can't see that I'm going to have fun at a convention at a Holiday Inn, you know. And under happiness, you mean I'm going to see some joker take a birthday cake for not drinking for 365 days, and that's going to make me so happy I'm going to cry? You know? And I, I, there's no happiness there in those 18 years. And then I'd have looked at the things that were going to be problems. And I said, no way. Absolutely no way. You know, I don't tolerate anything. First sign of trouble, I drink and slash my wrist. <laughs> and I mean it. You know, my dog had fleas and I almost had a slip. I really... <laughs> That's true. I came home one night from a meeting. I'd been sober, oh, 40, 50 days, something like that. And I had a dog that I loved. I drank with everywhere. Took her to bars. I lived in a building that had a bar in it. She had her own bar tab. And that's, that's true. And I came in and I picked her up and how's mommy's little baby? And I looked and there were fleas on her. And I dropped her. <laughs> now, a man from AA called me right at that point. And he said, how are you? And I said, GGS, please, and I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> and he didn't say, God love him. He didn't say, well, what step are you working? Did you make a gratitude list? You know. <laughs> He didn't remind me of the dear suffering alcoholic around the corner or tell me all the things that I or any of that. He said, I'll be right over. And I sat outside my house like this. And he walked past me with a can of flea spray, went in the house, sprayed the dog, came out and told me it was okay to come in. <laughs> so now when you've got someone that that temperamentally unstable... <laughs> And I would have looked at these next 18 years, and I'd have said, absolutely not. You know, I'm not going to go through that and not drink. In fact, I'm not going to go through that at all. I am a chronic suicide. I used to come home and, you know, brush my teeth, turn on the gas, and go to bed. <laughs> and I had... Uh, I have an old drinking buddy that I talked to a couple weeks ago, and she lived across the street. And, you know, it's amazing how other people get caught up in our diseases because she lived right across the street. And Dee Dee and I still ask about what she would do every night. She'd put her cat out, come over to my house, turn off the gas, go home, go to bed. <laughs> so there is no way for someone like me to live in this world. I mean, I just absolutely couldn't. It seemed like whatever it was that other people had or did or were interested in or worked for them or made them happy or it made it easy for them, I didn't have. It was just work for me. And as the drinking got worse, the work got harder. And it got harder to pretend. And the last year of my drinking was the most comfortable year of my life until I was sober about three years. Because by then it was all over. Uh, I didn't have to pretend to be a stewardess anymore. The airlines didn't expect me. I didn't intend to go out there. Uh, my mother had been called out here, out to L.A., to sign me into a mental institution. So I didn't have to pretend with my mother that everything was fine, and I just met a nice young doctor, and we were probably going to get married in the spring. No. And I didn't have to pretend to my friends that I wasn't drinking. And I'd already been hospitalized for alcoholism several times. I was familiar with hallucinations, and I had cirrhosis of the liver. And there was a great emotional freedom. <sighs> I did not have to pretend. And I was 30 years old, and it seemed to me that I'd spent my whole life just trying to pretend. And I don't know why, and it doesn't make a whole lot of difference, but that's the way I felt. And when friends of mine would talk to me about getting sober, I would think, why? 
you know, what are you going to give me? It's going to make it any different. You're going to give me a new girlfriend, a new boyfriend, a new city, another job, a car. I've got a car. I don't know where it is, but I've got one. Uh, <laughs> somewhere out there. Um, and the one thing I knew was that life just didn't work for me. And one morning I came to, I wasn't any sicker than I've ever been. In fact, I'd been a lot sicker. And on that particular morning, I just couldn't stand throwing up anymore. Just could not stand throwing up anymore. And somehow I staggered the phone and called Alcoholics Anonymous. And a woman talked to me for about two hours. And thank God she wasn't one of those people who have decided that somehow they got sober and became God Almighty. Because she didn't tell me, call back when you get sober. Because you see, had I not been drunk, I wouldn't have called AA in the first place. No. And she said they re would pick me up for the meeting that night. And then I got panicked because I thought, now you've done it, Dale. Now you've gone and called AA, and they're coming. <laughs> and I was too drunk to put it together that I could call and stop them. It was like <laughs> they were coming, and I had to go. And my first meeting, they, they took me, and I was very sick, and I'd been on a drunk for six weeks. And I weighed about 103 pounds, throwing up all the time. So they took me off to this meeting. I don't remember anything that was said. After the meeting, they all went to a restaurant and took me with. Now, if you've ever been on that kind of a drunk with cirrhosis liver, the one place you can't be is a restaurant. Yeah. And I went and stood outside and leaned up against the wall, and I was throwing up on my shoes. And a man came out of that restaurant. And he brought a towel, and he cleaned me up, and he put his arms around me. And he said, baby, this is the last drunk you'll ever have to shake out. And for some reason, I remembered that. And the people that took me to the meeting brought me home and dropped me off in front. And I went in and went to sleep, and I had lots of booze in the house. Lack of alcohol was never my problem. Yeah. And I kept thinking, this is the last drunk I'll have to shake out. Now, the only thing that makes this interesting at all and if you're around here and you become kind of a know-it-all, or if you're around here and you're a slipper and you're feeling guilty, please listen to this. Because a few old days later, I was in a meeting and I saw this guy. And I went running up to him because he was the first person that was ever kind to me in AA. And I was glad to see him. And I said, hi, I've got three or four days, whatever it was. And after that, several people told me, stay away from him. He was a loser. And I kept getting warned. I'd talk to this guy, and there was always, there were always a few jerks around to tell me that he was a loser. He'd been around this program six or seven years, couldn't get sober, and I shouldn't talk to him. He, the loser, was the one person that was kind to me at my first meeting. You know. So if you've been slipping around here, you are not a loser. And if you've been sober around here a few years and you think someone who's slipping is a loser, uh, you're probably in a lot of trouble with your own ego. And, you know, God help you if you ever drink again, because what in the hell are you going to do if you sit in that kind of judgment? How do you come back to it? It took this guy another six years to get sober, but he saved my life, you know. And one of the things around Alcoholics Anonymous that I've learned is, you know, speaking isn't the measure of the, of the person, and neither is sobriety. Some of the nicest, kindest, most gentle people I have ever known have died drunk. And there's some real mean old bastards who've been sober a lot of years. <laughs> That's true in Texas, too. I thought it was just Southern California. <laughs> so that sobriety is not the measure of the person. What seems to matter is whether we ourselves are willing to pay the price to stay sober. And I've known some wonderful people who just couldn't do it. Yeah. And we can want it for you in, in the worst way. There are people I know that I've got 18 years. I'd give them 17 of my year. I don't care about years. It doesn't matter. We're not in a competition. But I wish I could take a, a few years and say, here, here, here's three years. But I can't do it. We can't give it to you. All we can do is hope that you want it. You know? 
And if you can't make it, a lot of people couldn't. But if you keep coming back, maybe you will. Now, and Ebby, who carried the message to Bill Wilson, did not get sober for, I believe it was 11 years. No. So, you know, don't let yourself worse get tangled up with whether you can make this program or not. That's not the issue. I hope you stay sober. But that is not the issue. Anyway, I staggered in here. And the one thing I was certain of was that if I quit drinking, I would fall apart. And I think it's the only time in my life I've been totally right because I quit drinking and I just totally fell apart. I mean, I couldn't, I got to where I couldn't go in rooms with people in them. If two or three people looked at me, I would just get like this. My sponsor took me to a doctor. She said I was becoming epileptic. And I was hoping I was, you know, because I thought at least that's a reason for all of this carrying on. But I knew inside it was just fear. And I didn't know what fear was. I mean, I wasn't consciously afraid, and yet I'd run out of supermarkets. I knew the butcher wasn't after me. You know. But I have knocked over carts, run over children, damn near gone through plate glass windows because I just had to get out. And my sponsor told me if I couldn't go in the room, hang around the kitchen. I have listened at windows of meetings because I couldn't go in. And I was so scared that I was sober a year and a half before I ever said my name. Not because I didn't want to, and not because I was ashamed or embarrassed to be an alcoholic, and not because I didn't think you were kind people. I just couldn't do it. I trembled too much. Not just a little fear. I mean, I would absolutely get spast. So I was sober a year and a half, and if you're here tonight and you think you can never get up on a podium, that doesn't matter either. That doesn't matter. What my sponsor told me is, if they ask you to do something and you can't do it, you do something else instead. And they'd ask me to do something like read because I couldn't. It wasn't that I wouldn't. It was that I couldn't. Then I would say, okay, I'll pick up all the ashtrays tonight or I'll wash the cups, but I'll do something instead. And if there is a level of self-worth, I think we find it here. I found it here. Because what happened is I had sponsors who made me go on 12-step calls. They never asked me. Everything that I did my first year, I was made to do. They made me go back to work, and I felt I wasn't ready. And their feeling was, and they were right, if they waited till I got ready, we'd still be waiting. Because <laughs> I was never going to get ready. And they operated under the theory that when I would do better, I'd feel better. And my theory was when I felt better, I'd do better. <laughs> But they had made it very apparent they didn't want what I had. <laughs> and, you know, neither did I. You know, we were, we were in agreement that nobody wanted what I had. <laughs> so that if I wanted what they had, I was going to have to do what they did. So ready or not, <laughs> I had to go back to work. And ready or not, I had to go on 12-step calls. And ready or not, I had to help set up the meetings. Ready or not, I had to do a fourth step. And I'm grateful that they didn't wait for me to get ready. And if you're waiting to get ready, uh, the best thing I can tell you is, you know, ready or not, game starts the day you're going to have to get out there and play and see how you do. Because the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, as far as I can tell, is designed for my living. Not for my hiding and not for my dying, but for my living. And I had to learn how to work. Now, I'd been with the airlines, but I learned from a man in Alcoholics Anonymous who told me, honey, all you have to do is stay sober and help God's kids do what they think needs to be done. And all American Airlines wanted me to do was show up an hour before the flight, preferably sober. Um, and they thought they wanted to get that plane to New York and that the passengers needed service. And they were paying me to, to help. They weren't paying me to be president of the company. <laughs> And they didn't, weren't interested in what I thought. They just wanted me to help them do that. Then I, when I left the airlines, I went to work for a company called Bullocks, a, a retailer there. And, uh, cause I needed a job. And I had a job in downtown Los Angeles selling hosiery. And I hated every minute of it. I mean, I'm really grand. Um, and by then I was three years sober and I was talking all over in Alcoholics Anonymous four or five nights a week. I was going crazier one day at a time, but I sure sounded good. And 
there I am selling hosiery. Yeah. And then I had to figure out, okay, Bullocks thinks they need to sell hosiery, and these women think they need to buy it, and all my business is is to go help them. <laughs> and buying hosiery at Bullocks was an experience while I was there. Yeah. <laughs> But I learned to work, and I learned if there was anything that I was taught, and anything I know of value, I've been taught in AA. Believe me, the information I came in here with was not of any value to anybody on earth. And I learned that, that that's the first most important lesson. If my business is only, only to stay sober and help God's kids do what they think needs to be done. And one of the things that's happened through the years is that I've been like a lot of people, and I know my friend Chris sitting here tonight, is that, you know, we get into AA, and if we get real successful, what a lot of us do and what I did, I wouldn't talk, I didn't want to talk about it because I didn't want to sound like I was bragging. And you get shot down enough by assholes anyway. You know, so I didn't want to put myself in that position, so I wouldn't talk about it. The other thing I never talked about was when I was really in trouble. I would talk to my friends, and I would talk to sponsors, and I would go to the people in AA, but I would never talk about it from a podium until it was solved, and then I would come and tell you about the problem I had and how I was clever enough and had a good enough program and, a, you know, really a, oh, a, probably a, a superior higher power <laughs> and how we had taken care of it. No. And now something's happened in the last year that I've, I've kind of changed because I want to talk about some of these things. Because I want to talk about what life is about and what sobriety is about and the value it, that it is to me. Because what happened along the line is through a series of circumstances, I got into a business at the right time that was perfect for me. And I, I became a real estate broker in Southern California uh, right at the boom. And I loved it. And the program worked for me because all I did was stay sober and try and help them do what they thought needed to be done. And they thought they needed to buy and sell houses. And, honey, I was there to help. You know. <laughs> and I got 6% of everything they wanted to do. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was terrific. And Laurie and I had a lot of fun. And all of a sudden I became, quote, a, a self-made millionaire. Now, no one in my family had ever been in that position. And we had a lot of fun, and I did a lot of things with my family and sent them on trips. And there wasn't anything that my dad, I knew of, wanted that, that we didn't do about. Because he spoiled me when I was a little girl, and I spoiled him as an old man. You know, and I was daddy's girl, little girl till the day he died. And we went to Super Bowl, and they went to Hawaii, and they went on cruises. And Lori and I took trips, and I contributed to a lot of things, you know. And I had decided, by the way, when I was sober about three, I didn't decide. When I was sober about three years, I fell in love with a woman. And no one was quite that open in those days. You know, it was kind of closeted. But I was involved enough and honest enough that I knew that if I was going to live my life, I was going to have to live it as me, no matter what happened. And I've got to tell you, no, no one threw me away. I had one friend who could not deal with my being a homosexual or a lesbian. And I understand why she couldn't. She was an actress, and she was afraid that if she was seen with me, that people would think that she was a lesbian, and it would ruin her career. And that makes perfect sense. You know, I didn't understand at the time. But time went on, and Lori and I were having a good time, and my family was having a good time, and then along came Anita Bryant. <laughs> and I had given up politics. I thought that was back before I got to it, and I took it personally. I thought, just one minute. <laughs> Who do you think you're dealing with? And I got very involved with gay politics. And then we had a joker named John Briggs who decided that homosexuals couldn't teach in the state of California. And I took that personally, too. I don't know why I'm not a teacher. <laughs> but I thought, just a minute there. Yeah. Because, you see, the people in Alcoholics Anonymous had made it all right for me to be me for so long that I didn't have a feeling of being prejudiced. You know, I'd never hidden it, and I just got furious, and it was anger that was the motivation, not love and concern for the poor, you know, homosexual. I just got mad at him, and I got very involved in uh, 
we did defeat Briggs and worked very hard on it. And I was in the kind of business where I, I own my business. I certainly wasn't going to fire me for being gay, you know. <laughs> now, out of all of that, you see, you had let me be a part of Alcoholics Anonymous. Then I became a part of part of all that. And then they, they one night, have, they, they set up and they had a, a dinner in my honor and it was hosted by the governor. And I did something I'd never done before was I wrote a letter to my parents, and they they spent their winters out in Palm Springs, and Lori and I always traveled with them, the four of us, you know, and all that. I assume they knew, but like most Southern families, we don't discuss things like that. And so I wrote them a letter because I wanted to know if they wanted to come to this dinner. And they were surprised. They did not know that, that we were gay. And all my friends, they met in twos, you know. <laughs> But they, my dad was a good old boy from Kentucky. What the hell did he know? You know, if you weren't a hairdresser, it never occurred to him. <laughs> so, what happened is my parents, uh, they called me, and they said they wanted to come to the dinner. And there were like a thousand people there. And I got to be a part of all that. And God, my mother and dad stood up in the room, gave him a standing ovation, and I cried like a baby. You know, and I thought, all the things that happened were because of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I don't want to tell you all the years have been great, because they haven't. But I have had the most incredible 18 years. And there have been, I mean, the, the great things have been things that I would never expect. You know, I'm a drunken hillbilly. And I was invited to the White House. Not because I'm so terrific, but because I happen to be a lesbian activist. And Jimmy Carter didn't like us that much, but he wanted our votes and our money. <laughs> and off we went. You know. And all the things, and it's important because now I've got a few things I want to tell you that are really serious. Is there were, through the years, lots of ups and downs and taught me to, to help people do what they think needs to be done. And Chuck Chamberlain told me when I was sober a couple years. He said, honey, you're going to have to make up your mind. Either you're going to be part of the answer around here or part of the problem. And I knew what he was talking about was my growing up. And I was always somebody's problem. And there were always people around that were going to straighten me out. You know, the love of a good woman, the love of a good man, the love of, you know, a good couple, the love of good something. And I had to make up my mind that I was going to try and be part of the answer instead of part of the problem. And that's kind of difficult because you watch all the people being part of the problem, you know, and a lot of tension goes along with with all of that. But I had to do that, and I think those are probably the two most important things that I was taught. And and life went on, and I've always been very involved in Alcoholics Anonymous and babies and friends and politics, and we were just on the top of the world in 1980. I mean, it was just absolutely great. And it seemed like the more I did and the more successful and the better things were, the more meetings I went to. Not because I'm so great, but I'm real superstitious, you know. <laughs> and I was afraid to rock the boat. And I come from a small family. And it started in 1980 in the first place my grandmother died. And I was my grandmother's little girl. You know, She and my father were the two people that always thought I was perfect no matter what. People would say to my dad, aren't you proud of Gail? And he'd say, I've always been proud of Gail. <laughs> and he said it like he intended to shoot you if you continue. <laughs> so my grandmother died. Then my brother, uh, his wife got cancer. And Sally died at 38 and left my brother with three little children. And then the economy got bad. And from being rich... Uh, I was facing bankruptcy for a long time. Now, when I got here, I, I really didn't have anything except a wardrobe, and I'm not sure how I got that. Um, but it's different when all of a sudden, there you are, and you've got it all, and it's going away. You know? And it's, it's just going. And my grandmother was gone, and my brother's a widower with three little children. Then, a year ago, May, my dad died. And you know what happens with this program is you learn over the years that you can handle anything. And I would have told you I couldn't handle those things. I mean, I've got to drink over my, my poor brother being left with those children. And I've got to drink when my dad dies because I'm his little girl. Then last November, my only cousin. But by the way, there are eight people in our family. 
in last November, my only cousin, who was a 25-year-old alcoholic, who thought he was too young for Alcoholics Anonymous. And he was in a drunken accident, and he was a drunken driver, and he was killed. And there we were. And it never occurred to me to drink. It never occurred to me to drink. Not because I'm so terrific, but I think because I've been around here long enough that, in the first place, I, I know nothing's going to be made better by drinking. Yeah. And then last February, I started getting sick. And I've never been sick. I have more energy than any three people. I keep lots of lives going and lots of people going and just lots of everything. And what we found out in April was that I have cancer. And I stood there at Cedar sinai Hospital and looking out the window. I was on the, one of the top floors. And we have an area in Southern California uh, called Century City. And the last time I was hospitalized for alcoholism was in 1964. And I looked out from my room at Cedars, and I could just about see Beverly Hills Doctors Hospital. And the tears were running down my face, not because I had cancer, but because I was thinking, God, how do you go from there to here? It's six miles and 18 years. And all the people and all the things and I was crying because I thought, you know, I could have missed it all. I could have missed it all. I could have gone back to drinking, or I could have been one of the, the saddest people around Alcoholics Anonymous, those people who've been sober for a lot of years, in no program. They just don't drink. They never get to be a part of this thing called Alcoholics Anonymous. And I wanted to call my friend Julie. Because I was so grateful. I couldn't stop crying. And that is not my style. I am not a wonderful woman. Don't for one minute make any mistakes about that. I'm not. But I was so grateful. Because then I thought about all the friends of mine that I've known through the years. Who couldn't make it. Who missed it. Who missed it all. And at that point I thought, no matter what happens, I've got no quarrel. I've got no quarrel with God. I've got no quarrel with life. I've got no quarrel with anything. And I stood there with cancer feeling like one of the most fortunate women in the world. Now, I'd like to tell you that this whole year has been like that. It has. Because then I went through a, through a lot of pain and a lot of things. And I have friends in Alcoholics Anonymous and out of Alcoholics Anonymous who never left me alone. I mean, Lori's had a cot in my room and Julie's had a cot in my room and Chris and Kay come into the hospital at, at midnight. With Chris acting like she owned the goddamn place. And, and, you know, the doctors and the nurses at the hospitals have never seen anything like this. And my room was always like I come to in Covent Garden. Then one day what happened is for some reason I had gone down to get radiation and I had asked the doctor how long it was going to take this whole thing. And he said six months and I'd gotten back up to the room. And they'd given me a lot of medication and all. And I guess whoever had gone downstairs to get a bite to eat. And I was by myself in the room. And I was standing at that same window that I'd been so grateful at before. And I was crying because I had reached a point where I was like a, a, a feeble little old lady. I couldn't fill out my menu. And I'd gotten out of my room the night before and gotten lost. And I was shaking. And I was standing at that window, and once again, I was crying. But I wasn't crying out of gratitude. I was crying because I thought, I said, God, I can't make it. I can't live like this. I just can't. I am not afraid of dying, but I can't live like this. And I was crying on my fingers to count how far it was going to be for six months. And I kept getting different answers. And then I'd cry more. And finally, I hit November, like three or four times. And I just said, God... I can't, I can't be like this in November. I can't do it. And the phone rang. Now, because I didn't want my mother and brother to know I had cancer because I felt they'd been through enough, there was no way in the world for anyone to reach me. I was very protected with no visitor signs, and the people in my office never gave out that number. But somehow there's a turkey here in Houston named Roy Cameron that I'd known in L.A. And I don't know how he did it, but he somehow convinced the guy in my office that he was my best friend in the whole world, and he got the number to my hospital room. And the phone rang that when I'm in tears, and I 
got over to the phone, and I was pissed off because the phone rang, and no one was there to answer it, and I couldn't stop crying, and it was rough. And he said, honey, what's wrong? And I said, oh, I'm just in a little pain. And he said, well, maybe I can make you feel better. We're going to have a convention in Houston, and we'd like for you to come talk. And then I cried more because I said, Roy, I can't because my health is not that good now, and I don't know how to be sick. And he said, well, honey, it's not for a long way off. And I said, when is it? And he said, the last week in November. And then I really cried because to me it was a message that I was going to make it to November. And I want to show you something. After I got out of the hospital that time, a friend had this made up. Now, this hangs in my bedroom, and I've had it hanging in the hospital. And it's never been more than five feet from me since last April. And I don't know if you can see it, but what it says is Thanksgiving in Houston. And this year... I wish I could stand it up, but I want you people to know that there have been times this year when I thought, I can't make it. And Lori or someone would point out, they'd say, look at your sign, Gail. Look at your sign, Gail. And I'd look at the sign, and I thought, I'm going to spend Thanksgiving in Houston. And there have been people who've come with me. And I'm, I'm back at work most of the time, and I'm back in politics. In some of the time, <laughs> and I'm certainly involved with Alcoholics Anonymous. No. And I don't know what's going to happen. I'll tell you what I think is going to happen. I think I'm going to get well. I believe I'm going to get well. Yeah. I don't want to start crying because I won't stop. But I've got people all over the country praying for me. I got a call from someone at the MCC Church in Davenport, Iowa, that they were praying for me. And people all over AA and other friends, you know. But whether I do or not, whatever happens, you know, we've only got one day at a time anyway. What I've got is 18 years. And you people gave me a life that I would never have had with all the ups and all the downs. And i got to figure, you know, God, I wanted a life and I wanted it all. And if that life includes cancer, okay. You know, that's part of it. And with this program, we can go through anything. And we're having to learn in L.A. because I talk about it. And it's a scary word. And some of the people in the ad watch people turn their back because they didn't know what to say to me. And I didn't know what to say to them. And we, none of us really know how to handle it, but we're handling it, you know. And people don't turn their back on me. And nobody has ever left me alone, not for one minute. You know, and they're not going to, I know that. And if, if you're around here, please, God, stay. If you're here 30 days, you're not going to understand. I'm talking about the people three years to five years. Stay here. Become a part of this thing. Because what we have here is a life. It's a life with everything. You know, and I've heard people say, if I didn't drink, you don't have to. And believe me, if I haven't drank this year, you don't have to. And there was a little girl I heard. Her grandmother was raising her because her parents were dead. And I was sober about two years. And this little girl at a meeting discussion, she said, I want to thank all the people in AA because if there was, wasn't for you, there wouldn't be anyone to take care of me. And i got to tell you, I'm 48 years old, and I'm 18 years sober, and I'm relatively slick and sometimes very scared. And the truth is, if it wasn't for you, there would not be anyone to take care of me. And thank you, Roy, and God bless you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.